Okay, welcome to Hannah Friedholm BFA exhibition, Amor's Ashes, Armor's Ashes, sorry, Armor's Ashes. Let me just read the first thing wrong. Fantastic start to this evening. I'm gonna take two. Hello and welcome to Hannah Friedholm's BFA exhibition, Armor's Ashes. Although we are joining virtually from a number of places, I always like to do a land acknowledgement and I ground us here where Sierra Nevada University is, which is in Incline Village, Nevada. We sit on historical Washoe land. The Washoe people have lived, thrived, and stewarded on this land long before the college was here and continue to do so. So I just want to acknowledge the Washoe people for taking such wonderful care of this land and pay our respects to the elders, both past and present for our thanks. So, as I said, we will be hearing from Hannah and then at the end, we're gonna have a Q&A. So please stick around for that. Be thinking about questions for Hannah. For those of you who are maybe not used to my spiel, I'll give it to you. My name is Anza. I'm the gallery director. I use the pronouns they, them. And Sierra Nevada University Fine Arts oversees all of the things that we are doing right now. We have a BA and a BFA in Fine Arts. And Hannah here has completed, as of tonight, her BFA in Fine Arts. For those of us who have been through the BFA process or have watched other people go through it, we know that it is a time intensive and um, difficult, sorry, I just got a notice. Um, I've heard that there are some issues on Eventbrite. So if anyone is having issues with Eventbrite, I'm very sorry about that. Um, our BFA process, makes it so students take an additional 15 credits in a concentration of their choosing. It also requires that they install an entire show, make an entire body of work, and then sit here and talk to us about it. And it is no small task, literal blood, sweat, and tears go into these BFA shows. And it's an amazing experience for the student. And Honestly, one of the joys that I get to see in my position as gallery director is seeing the artwork that our students are making here. So we are absolutely thrilled and so proud of Hannah tonight with her BFA show. And so I'm going to not sit here and give you a monologue about how wonderful Hannah is and how wonderful she has been as a student and putting up this show. I am instead going to hand it over to Hannah for the rest of this evening. And we'll see you again at Q&A. I have shut my balcony because I do not want to hear the weeping. But from behind grey walls, nothing else is heard but the weeping. There are very few angels that sing. There are very few dogs that bark. A thousand violins fit into the palm of my hand. But the weeping is an immense dog. The weeping is an immense angel. The weeping is an immense violin. The tears muzzle the wind. Nothing else is heard but the weeping. As an artist, I'm always questioning what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. I've always worked with my hands, especially in clay, being my main medium. Um, for this body of work, I've created sculptural assemblages from ceramic as well as found objects. In this work, I'm aligning the emotional and psychological aspects of mortality and the universal experience of grief. 
For me, my work is navigating the raw response to loss, and I hope that it allows the viewer to connect with their own sensibilities. I think about absence and presence and the void between a lot. For me, making this work is easier than having the conversation. Therefore, I feel like the gravity of my emotion is expressed through this coping mechanism. I've always been interested in ideas and rituals involving preservation, so dipping these dead birds and crabs into slit, firing them and preserving their physical presence makes sense. In a way, I'm stopping the decaying process and paying reverence to these beings. For me, the clay takes on the form of these once living creatures, safeguarding their ashes inside. This current body of work has allowed me to address loss and heartache by creating and connecting to the moments that have passed. So that poem that I read at the beginning is a poem by Federico Garcia Lorca was one of my brother's favorite poems. Um, to begin with, I just wanted to talk about um, universal grief. Um, I think that in our current times, people have been experiencing much more grief and in a much more isolated fashion. And it's really hard to mourn when only a few people are allowed to go to a funeral People have to watch a recording on a screen. Um, they can't give each other a hug, etc. Um, I think that society wants to rush people to move on and kind of get over it, get back to normal. Um, I think I think that that mourning period should last however long is necessary for the individual. I think that grieving is very different experience for each individual. Um, if you try and look up the stages of grief, there are all kinds of numbers. Um, and I think that the reason for that is because it's so unique for each person um, and the stages can happen at any time, no particular order. Um, and when you think that one stage is over, it can come back. Um, we, all, we all experience it, but why do we feel so alone in it? Um, and I think it's going back to that individual experience, even if you have experienced serious grief, then you don't necessarily know how somebody else has. Um, we have this fear of saying the wrong thing because it's really hard, it's awkward, it's strange, it's weird. It's this unfixable problem that um, I think we as human beings want to fix problems. Um, but with this, there's no silver lining there's no like cure for pain. Um, so in that sense, I think that our social norms should be re-examined. Um, when you look back in time at like the Victorian era, their grieving last, lasted a lot longer. Um, it was allowed for two years, I believe. Um, for that of a widow and they would wear a specific dress code and they would um, have a restricted social life. And I'm not saying that that is 
how everybody wants to grieve or should grieve but I think just like that long time frame is what means something to me because I don't think that grief ever goes away it's something that's always there um yeah and then for me my grief is um my brother died this is a print I did of him um it's still really hard to say that Um, so this is the work, first work I started making about him, apart from um, me and my mum made his urn and his um, coffin. We didn't make the coffin, but we, we decorated the coffin. Um, so this was the semester before last where I I spent time making work specifically about him. Um, and I think it helped just in the sense of, I had something to do. This was an online class. It was when COVID was still pretty bad and we couldn't go in to the campus. Um, so I think it was quite therapeutic for me to have something like printmaking where I could use my hands and make work that was very personal to me um and then thinking back again just about that reality of what loss how long it lasts and the waves um and then the expectation of what society wants it to be i just thought that was a good visual representation um, that's a picture of my brother. Um, he was helping me to dig up my horse that was buried 16 years previous. We never, we never managed to find the. I was trying to get the skull, and we never managed to find the skull. But we dug dug many holes, and um, he was a good sport about it, as always. Um, so as I talk, I'm just going to go through um, some images of the show for those people who haven't been able to see it in person. I also have posted them on my Instagram if anyone needs to go back and check it out. Um, I'll put it in the chat if anybody wants wants to have a closer look. So I think in grief, um, you feel like a part of you is missing. Um, and in the show, I think there's there's a few pieces where there are pieces missing, there are upturned chairs, there are fragments of things, there are decaying things. Um, you feel this weight and heaviness, which I also tried to, um, put in the atmosphere of the show. And um, I think the rope piece kind of shows that. Um, yeah, it's all engulfing and you're not the same person anymore. You need to decipher the world again. For me, doing this work was a lot easier than having the conversation. It was something I could dive into and focus on that was was a help in in a sense um it's it was my way of coping my way of making something tangible about how i feel and i'm thinking about the past and where our memories lie and then i, I think it's also to do with the present in the fact that it's helping me to process an emotion it's helping, um, there's that like meditative state of doing ceramics especially, and then like the tying of the rope and just that time and commitment, I think, and not having that time to just let my mind 
do all the weird things our minds do. Um, I'm thinking about a sense of longing, fleeting moments, um, definitely nostalgia. Nostalgia is derived from the Greek word for return and suffering. It's about recalling memories and meanings from the past in a way that might be painful. So for me, I, I want people to enter this space and have a nostalgic experience. For me, it takes me to the past and offers remembrance. So I hope to do that for other people also. There's a sentimental longing. I think about my brother all the time. Um, especially when I'm making work, um, when I go to bed or yeah, all the time. Um, so I think it's, it's hard to not have that in the work. So yeah, memories, the fragility of life, um, especially with ceramics, you're creating these, Pieces that, yeah, they can last forever, but they're also pretty vulnerable to breakage and I'm pretty clumsy, so there's that. Um, we think that we always have all this time with people, um, but life is precious. So again, it's that those precarious objects that are vulnerable and fragile. And then left behind is this altered reality that you're supposed to navigate and negotiate. And things are weird, like you, the world, the normal things you do in the world become very hard. Um, but this is, is my coping strategy, is making this stuff. Because a lot of times I can't say what I'm feeling, but this somehow expresses it for me. And I don't think I really need people to understand it. Um, it takes me away from that darker place, I guess, um, and allows some kind of output. So installing this um, took quite a while. There was a lot of decision making, which I'm not the greatest at. Um, so when I first started, I put everything in the room <laughs> just over that concrete floor. And then I had to pick a few pieces to put up. So it was that rope piece, the frames and the wooden wall. And then after that, I could kind of decide where everything else would would go. And then I, I just want to say too that I this work isn't supposed to be like asking for sympathy or empathy. Because to me, it's about remembering it's about memory and longing for something lost. And I hope that other people can come in and have that feeling and think about their own grief, loss, just even just memories, good memories of people that have touched them in their lives. Um, it's a form of visual expression for me in which I hope that others can think about their own emotions and reflect. Because without these people in our lives, um, and without the past, we wouldn't be who we are today. And I think losing someone makes you realize how much and how hard and strong you love them, even though I don't think that you didn't know that before, but I think the pain that you feel and that like feeling right here makes you understand that more and it's it's stupid that it you should understand that more after they're gone but it's that whole duality you know of um 
don't know what you've got till it's gone. That was a terrible thing to quote, but. Um, so I did want to actually give a quote that was um, sent to us by one of my brother's friends. It's by Robert Webb from the book, How Not to Be a Boy. And it really resonated with me. So I'd, I'd just like to read it to you guys. The sadness that we feel now, we can afford to hold close. Safe as we are in the knowledge that grief is love's echo. We only have to listen and it's there. Today is a heavy day. But this is just an aftershock. The earthquake, the main event, as usual, was love. Um, and then real quick, I'd just like to look at a couple of my influences. Um, this first one is Enrique Martinez Celea. His work just gives off this atmosphere, this mood that I love. Um, it's I see like a yearning, a loss. I see memory, I see exile. And I just hope that I can give off um, just some of that emotion that he, he can portray in, in these beautiful paintings. And then Anna Mendita, um, her work is very powerful. She died in her thirties. Um, and again, it's that atmosphere and mood that really captures me. And she has like a se sense of belonging. Um, there's obvi obviously themes of um, life and death, nature, the female body, um, just really inspiring. And then lastly, Joseph Cornell. So looking at um, these boxes that he made with using the found object. And obviously I used a lot of the found object in my work too. And I think there's something about the found object that you don't necessarily need to make everything yourself. Um, sometimes there's a lot of meaning that just lies in an object that you trying to make or recreate that object, you don't need to because all that stuff is already there. Um, and his, his boxes just kind of show me the confines of the mind. They're like personal, personal memories, they're altars, they're, there's a sense of longing and loneliness and I just really relate to them. And then we're gonna wrap it up. Um, I just want to say a couple thank yous. Courtney for helping me get some really good images of the show. I wouldn't have been able to have done that without you. Rick, Sherry and Mary for all your help my whole time at SNU, but in particular this past year. Um, you guys have taught me so much and I love you guys and I'll miss you guys. Um, appreciate you. Um, and Julia for helping out in the studio this semester when I couldn't do as much as normal and you really uh, picked everything up quick and really helped out, appreciate you. Yeah, so thank you. Thanks, Hannah. Yay. I want us all to just like first acknowledge and congratulate you and just like see you for what you just presented us with. So like, we'll take a moment for that before we go into questions. So just like so much love for you, Hannah. And this is the part where we get to do questions. So please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. And if you're unable to mute yourself, you can um, type it in the chat and we'll read it on out. Mm -hmm. 
Yep. You want to yeah, Hannah. <laughs> <laughs> No questions, so we're done, right? <laughs> and you're done getting off that easy, Anna. <laughs> oh no, a Chris question. Well, no, I mean, I, you know, I mean, I think, I think to address it, or it, I mean, to address it head on. I mean, I, in some ways, it's difficult to ask questions, and and I think this goes back to what you were saying, uh, you know, about the. Um, you know, in terms of grief, you know, that, that there's nothing you can do to fix it. And even saying something seems really inadequate. So it's hard, it's difficult to jump into the breach in some ways. Um, you know, I, 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 uh, uh, I do have a question for you though, <laughs> um, uh, which, which, has to, which has to do with um, making work out of, out of grief. Um, you know, I, I I made a couple of bodies of work after losing my uh, uh, grandmother, which has a different. I mean, she had lived a good life, a, a long life. It, you know, doesn't have that shock. You know, the shock of losing someone young. But uh, you know, there's this idea of kind of catharsis that the, that the work is sort of a catharsis that helps helps you through it. Although I I don't know if that was really my experience of it. I, it there's this weird contradictory sense of. I think socially wanting to move you through something or move you past something. But while you're making the work, you're really in contact with the grief and you're in contact with the person in some way. Um, and and I, yeah, and I'm just kind of curious if, if you've given thought to art, art that is addressed to grief and loss and wh whether it is catharsis or whether it's something else. My, myself, I think it's something else and I'm not sure I can put a word to it. Yeah, I mean, I think I don't think it means that you're getting over it by any means. Um, for me, it's more having that thing to focus on that keeps me busy, but I'm still always thinking about it. But I can use my hands and do something where there's like a result. Because I think otherwise, if I wasn't doing this, I would be more of a hot mess than I am, I guess, <laughs> you know, like I would not, I don't know, I probably would stay up all night and, be, but because I had to come to school and do this work and had um, some kind of um, like structure that I had to conform to. I mean, I even like, I started seeing someone to talk about it and they kept kind of telling me to quit. They're like, you don't have to like put on this show. You don't have to do any of this stuff. And I'm like, I feel like that's really bad advice <laughs> for me. You know, like I needed that to have that thing to do that kept me going as a person and kept me in line somehow, I guess, if that answers your question. No, it, 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 it does. It does. I mean, I, I mean, I think there's that quality of not necessarily moving beyond, but moving, being able to keep in contact with that person, but still being able to move oneself. And yeah, I, I, I think you just spoke to that quite eloquently. Thank you. <laughs> Stephanie, I see ah. a question. Do you want to unmute and ask it or do you want me to read it on out? Yeah. I suppose I can just read it. <laughs> I can't seem to type fast enough. Um, hello, Hannah. I love your work a lot. Um, and I want you to know that I personally feel a lot of the same things that you're feeling. And I think that my artwork tends to align very strongly with the same essence that yours conveys. Um, so I guess my, my question, or I'll, I'll preface it, is um, a lot of the time I find um, returning to the same object or image tends to um, be a grounding point for me emotionally. And for me personally, my artwork tends to um, come back to drawing or looking at Mount Rose here from down in Reno. And um, so I tend to draw that mountain range a lot because it seems to epitomize the sense of hope. And so I was wondering, is there any object or place or imagery that you tend to circle back to, to have a continuous conversation with? Because your work um, seems to be drawn to a lot of domesticated or domestic objects. 
Um, and so I was just curious if there's ever conversations that you're able to have with certain objects that you bring back in your artwork on a regular basis. Yeah, actually, not not really the domestic object for me, but um, the bird. <laughs> I did. I want to apologize too. I did miss the first half of your of your presentation. So if I missed oh, that's that, okay. I think we'll have it recorded, like on available for you somewhere if you want to watch the beginning. But yeah, yeah. I think that the the bird frequents my work quite a lot. Um, I feel like just animals to me um, mm -hmm. mean a lot. And, and my brother had like this affinity with, with birds in this like really strange way. So I think that, yeah, the bird. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. We've got a question from Lauren. Lauren, do you want to unmute or you want me to read this on out? Okay, from Lauren. I'm curious what the thought behind the wallpaper is and if the print and or colors were specific to you. Um, I think that the wallpaper just helped me to kind of situate everything and create like that nostalgic, kind of environment it's very old-fashioned wallpaper that um yeah that just kind of put that atmosphere and then the colors I don't like to use a lot of color in my work I like black a lot and white <laughs> so that kind of gave it this more uh, it gave some color to the show and also connected back to like the cyanotypes Kelso, did you have a question? You should unmute. I just saw you try and ask one. <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Yeah, hi. Hi, Nick's here too. Hi, Nick. Um, less of a comment or less of a question, more of a comment. Um, we missed the first half due to whatever technical issues I can't wait to rewatch. Um, I am so proud of you for doing this. And I have been looking forward to this show for a long time because I have myself wrestled with the idea of grief and moving past it. And I wanted to see your perspective and your outlet on that. Um, I think that, I mean, everything, you know that everything I think that you do is beautiful. So I am really looking forward to rewatching this and I'll probably have questions later, but okay. I just wanted to make sure you knew we were here and we love Thank you. Thank you, I'm so happy that you came. We love you, Han. Mwah. Question, question. Do you want to I have a... <laughs> Vinny. Hi. You can get closer if you want. Okay, I can get closer? Yeah. Hi. <laughs> hey, what a fabulous exhibit, first off. It was wonderful. Um, it really moved me. Uh, I had a question for you, though. The, right when I walked in, I saw the exhibit to the left with the, uh, or the piece to the left with the kind of like conical, I don't know if they were like faces or what, but like as soon as I walked in, I got this like uneasy feeling because those things are kind of like creepy looking and you're not sure what they are and they kind of look like they're looking at you and there's a bunch of them and they look like petrified wood. Well, I just wanted, was wondering about your thought process behind it. That was like strategically placed for that reason. Yeah, um, I don't know if it was strategically placed for that reason. I didn't really install the show thinking, I guess that people would be entering through that door. But the idea behind them is just kind of like this weird obstruction. Um, yeah, and that uneasy feeling, because that's like part of the feeling that you feel a lot of the time, just walking into a space when you haven't seen someone, you know, that knows, not that knows what's happened or you haven't, it's the first time you see them after something like this has happened. 
I mean, I just took someone around the show that I hadn't seen since my brother died. And like, I just started crying when he said something to me about my brother. And it's like, it's that initial, like, I don't know that like weird, like barrier of like keeping everyone kind of away. Yeah, totally. And that's, those are ceramic, right? Those are ceramic, yes. Very cool. Thank you. Other questions for Hannah? Hi, Anza. This is uh, Lara. Can I go ahead? So I don't know if I have, uh, it's wonderful to see you and your work, Hannah, first I'll say it's been some time. Um, I don't exactly have a question. Um, I wanted to take a step back first and just acknowledge the visual continuity of your uh, or the continuity of your visual language as it has evolved. I think I first met you and first saw your work at your mapper. Um, and there is something distinct about how you relate to and, and use materials that comes through in a really profound way. And I see that here, even uh, in a virtual representation that, that I think um, is like kudos to you just on a um, craft level. Um, and I would also say that, let's see, I made myself some notes, so I would keep on track. Um, oh, that I really appreciate the way that you, um, someone else had, was talking about moving through grief, but I appreciate in this your emphasis that you're not asking of yourself or of a, a viewer that they actually be in motion and move through this experience. Instead, it's more of a holding space um, in a way that invites us to co-inhabit this experience with you. Um, uh, and then the other thing you mentioned in your presentation that you don't mean the work to function as a request for empathy or sympathy or some kind of garnering of attention. Um, and so I'm curious though, um, first I'll say, I don't think that it comes across that way in any regard. Um, yet I do think that in, in certain ways it does the inverse, meaning that it actually offers and reflects back um, the opportunity to be vulnerable in that space and the opportunity to find empathy, as you mentioned, at a time in particular when many of us are uh, globally in various states of grief moment to moment and in all kinds of different ways. So I find it just to be very generous. Um, you can respond to that if you'd like, but really it was just feedback. No, I, I appreciate that because I, I find it hard being the, the center of attention too. So. <laughs> We have a question from Adrian in the chat. Also, hi, Adrian. Um, did having people away because of the pandemic help this work? Um, well, the studio, we, we kind of got the studio back this semester. So the studio was pretty busy this semester, actually. So there were people around and at times it got a bit much for me when there were a lot of people in there I found it hard to sometimes work when there were a lot of people so yeah I think maybe at the beginning it it helped and then when everyone came back it made it harder I guess but I appreciated like being back in the studio and having everyone around and being able to to talk about work and have critiques again that weren't online for sure and I, I'm not saying that I I wish that we were not in the studio, but sometimes I get in that weird headspace that I just need 
to be alone for a bit to to make some some of the work we have another question in the chat from charles which aspect of this beautiful making did you lose yourself in the most hi charlie and katie i'm so happy you stayed up to watch um i think the window piece is like the most i got lost in because i it has like pictures of dan's t-shirt like a um, Polaroid transfers in there and it's just like this I don't know it just like was a lot very emotional for me to make that piece and think about it so probably that window piece Hannah, this is Russell. I ha have um, something of a of, of a question. It was wonderful to be to be in the in the space and and get to see the work physically the other day. And um, I thought your critique slash conversation with the faculty was was really spot on too. So um, I, I feel lucky to to be around be around the work. But w one of the things I I'm I'm kind of interested in is that sense of bringing in all the stuff and laying it all out on the floor and that the that, that sense of your decision making in relation to the graph that you showed about about grief being something something of something of a wave you know my experience of coming in and looking at the work it's it's a very full show there's a lot of pieces in that room and i think i said during the our conversation earlier that like I could easily see them spaced out across multiple rooms and stuff. But one of the things that I found kind of in intriguing was that like when I'm staring at what I'm considering to be one piece or, or another piece, I didn't have that sense that uh, the piece right behind me was interfering with my ability to, to uh, receive what was in front of me. And sometimes work installed like this is, you know, is supposed to be an installation, right? It's supposed to be a sort of uh, fluid and continuous environment. And I don't know if I'm reading it wrong to read them as in individual pieces um, or not, but I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm curious about if you could address more about that decision-making process and whether or not you see them as again, part of that wave or, or did they distill in a different way? So. No, I guess I, I see them as part of that wave in the sense of, yeah, I see them as individual pieces, but kind of flowing into each other. Um, I think you're right that there is a lot of stuff in there, but I don't think it would have the same atmosphere if there wasn't that much stuff, because I feel like that's kind of like my mind too, you know, so it's that kind of cluttered, like bouncing from one thing to another as well. And I didn't put a lot of stuff in too. I have so much other stuff that didn't go in. Yeah, well, thank, thank you. And that, that, that sounds like how it feels, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you, Russell, appreciate it. We're done. <laughs> hey, Kate, you did an oh. amazing job. Thank you, thank you for coming. So much love from Canada. Yeah, love you guys. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> well done, Hannah. Oh, thank you, Sarah. Unbelievable. Oh, so, thanks so for staying. Proud. Thanks for staying up so late. My pleasure. Unfortunately, I, it wouldn't let me on, so I'll have to see 
Yeah, I'll send mum, mum, I'll send mum the recording and she said she'd send it to you guys. Brilliant. Yeah, a lot of people want to see it, but amazing. Thank you. You really are amazing. Night, night. Night, night. Hey, Hannah, we missed it too. Oh, yeah. I'll send it to you, Nan. Okay, yes, because yeah. when we went on at eight o'clock Eastern time, they said it wasn't starting to 8.30. Yeah, oh, same with me. Same with a, me. Oh, I'm so sorry. There was a hiccup with the, the platforms talking to each other. We record everything, and I'm going to send that out to everyone who was on the <laughs> back. Oh, good, good, Eight. good. Say hi. Thanks for coming, though. Hi. Hi, Maddie. Night, night, hi. everyone. We're going to see you tomorrow, Hannah. <laughs> Say hi, Charlie. Aww. Aww. Girl, I'm so proud of you. Do you want Thank to you. See you.